Hello and welcome to the most extraordinary scene. Watching something that people don't see in almost every situation in life. This is exceptional. Live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya, watching five male cheetah as they hunt a wildebeest. But this is completely different to anything we've seen before. The way in which they do it is completely contrary to anything you'll read about cheetahs hunting there's no ambushing they're just harassing look one's off there at the back jogging forward and they've been doing this for the last half an hour we've been sitting with them watching them and this group of cheetah are known as the five musketeers and they are found in the Maasai Mara of Kenya this is on whatever platform you happen to be watching So welcome and hello to the Maasai Mara where we are watching a group of five male cheetah as they harass and hunt wildebeest. Look at the one at the back. The one at the back is off. They've been doing this for half an hour, chasing the wildebeest round and round, looking for the weakest possible link in this herd. It's completely different to what we know about a cheetah hunting. And the second one's coming up from behind. There goes the third one moving in. Wow, look at this. Look at the turn of speed of these animals. Pushing into the wildebeest herd, causing absolute chaos and pandemonium. All they're doing is creating panic and you're watching this happen live in the Maasai Mara of Kenya, which means send through your questions quickly, quickly send through anything you'd like to know and you can do that in the comments section below. This is phenomenal. We are learning so much about the way that these five males hunt. It is different. It is completely the opposite of what we've come to expect from an animal like a cheetah. They're using the advantage of numbers to press it home and essentially harass the wildebeest until they spot a weak link. They've been doing this for half an hour. But having five of them means that every time one of them goes forward and exhausts itself chasing them, the next one can actually step up and step in. The wildebeest are regrouping. They don't want to run away too far from the cheetah because they want to be able to see them. If they can see them, they are hoping instinctively that they will be safe from their attentions. Absolutely extraordinary. The five musketeers building up quite the reputation. Now, Nareko, you want to know how much meat can a cheetah eat? You might have noticed just how hungry these cheetah are. You're looking at around about 5 to 10% of their body weight. So if you've got a 50 kilogram cheetah, you're looking at around about 5 kilograms over 10 pounds of meat in one sitting. The poor cheetah, though, the problem with that is that they are constantly harassed by other predators. They lose their kills all the time. So while they are one of the most successful hunters out here, they often find themselves with only half a meal. Okay, the cheetah have stopped for now. It gives us an opportunity to get a little bit closer. This could go on for a considerable period of time. As I said, they've been doing this for half an hour. My name is Jamie. This afternoon, Craig is on camera with me. And as I said, live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya. Hold on, everyone. We're just going to take advantage of the break since the cheetah are tired and they're resting for now we're going to take advantage of it and we're going to move up a little bit closer to them now moving in the way that we are moving in the way that we are we're not going to change and they've known that they're there the entire time okay we do apologize if every now and again we get a little bit of a dip in signal. The weather here is tempestuous, to say the least. So it's causing a couple of strange things with our signal. I've seen this twice now with these male cheetah. They don't think about sneaking up on the wildebeest. They just heard them. They heard them 
until they've induced sufficient panic that one of the wildebeest becomes more vulnerable, becomes separated from the rest of the herd. There's the boys. Five male cheetah, and I think they might have just given up. They've decided that in this particular situation, they're not going to get lucky. Exhausted, the high-speed chase uses up a huge amount of energy. Mubo, you want to know where the Maasai Mara is? It's in the southern portion of Kenya, so on the border of, Ke of Tanzania, East Africa, essentially, and it's a massive, massive wilderness area. Cheetah are going to walk right past us. They are completely relaxed in our presence. These boys have grown up with safari vehicles around them. So they're not in any way made nervous by us. You can see that they're choosing to walk right past us. And that is what makes a region like this so very special. Because we can actually show you the extraordinary wildlife that lives here without interrupting their lives. Hello boys. Long time no see. I have spent many days with these boys. I think this is probably the thinnest I've ever seen them. They are hungry. Angel, yes, it does mean that they're going to go hungry for now. They haven't succeeded. They need a rest. The sun has come out. It's been raining all afternoon, but the sun has come out, and now they're exhausted. So what they need to do, because cheetah have such a phenomenal turn of speed, massive lungs and massive explosive energy within their muscles, We'll try again. Now all five of them have. That's why they've moved away. That's why they've given up. They're not just tired. Remember I said that they get harassed on a regular basis. There is absolutely no point in them trying to hunt now because the hyenas have discovered them. So even if they did make a kill now, the fact that there are three or more hyenas wandering about, they could easily chase one away, but there are three. And that's why they've given up, because if they kill now, they won't have had they won't have any success. There's actually four hyenas. The hyenas are actually moving in towards the wildebeest. Now hyenas hunt by their own right. Just because we have this idea and this, they have this reputation of being scavengers, it isn't 100% correct and hyenas are capable of hunting and in fact certain areas they do more hunting than they do scavenging. And in this case they've come to investigate the sound of a stampeding wildebeest. They will have heard the running and they've come to investigate. There's one, two, three, four, five a cheetah, uh, not cheetah, sorry, hyena. Now, Linda, yes, a hyena could potentially kill a cheetah, but I have seen these five males chase individual hyenas before. But five, five hyena against five cheetah, the cheetah will just not be a match for them. Hyena are much bigger, they've got much stronger jaws, and they, most of the time, they are relatively non-confrontational when it comes to the cheetah. They'll chase them away, but they won't act try to hurt them whereas when you get lions moving into an area like this the lions will actually target the cheetah they will chase the cheetah and if they catch them they will kill the cheetah so lions are a far bigger threat but the high the cheetah know not to even try at this point they've moved away there's no point to try and catch anything so five hyena have just moved in and if you have just jumped on board, this is 100% live. And Jana, as our hyenas trot off, and I think contemplate their next move as well, you want to know how long the cheetah can go without food. I assume you're talking about the cheetah. Because they've got such fast metabolisms, it's a lot less time than something like a lion or a leopard or a hyena. So you've seen how thin they look. That might just be a lack of a meal over the last two days. Ideally, they need to eat every two days or so, preferably every single day, uh, but they very seldom do. Oh, that's a, that's a three-legged hyena. Look at that. An old injury. It's not, she's, she hasn't lost the leg, but she does have quite a painful limp. She's got a, oh, she's walking on it fine now. No, that's, that's the hyena that ran in that I saw, the one that's lying down. 
That's the hyena that has a sore leg. Utterly incredible. So much happening there. Submissive behavior from that hyena. Now, I would love to tell you more about the social structure and the way that hyenas act. And they're incredibly complex societies. But we have cheetah to find and they have a meal to catch. So for now, we're going to say goodbye to those of you joining us for this action broadcast from Craig and myself. Thank you for joining us. But stay tuned. If anything changes, we will be back live with you from the Masai Mara. Sorry about that, everyone. It was a rather dramatic start. Um, Craig and I found the found the cheetah just before it was time for us to go live with the regular sunset safari, and we were having massive problems. There's enormous storms around where our repeater is, and I think that's been playing havoc with everything. So a quick sort of um, summary of the action. The male cheetah, from around about 20 past 3 until now, it is 10 to... 10 to 4. For the last half an hour they have been herding these poor wildebeest and chasing them around. Now all of this is completely 100% live in this case from Masai Mara but we will be joined by our team in South Africa. So for people who have just discovered this live stream the way that you get hold of us is hashtag safari live on Twitter. We didn't really have time to do the normal introductions and everything went a little bit confused so <laughs> we did things twice. I'm going to watch the behavior of these hyenas a little bit longer. We will catch up with the cheetahs but I just want to see there's some interesting submission and dominance happening with these guys so I'm going to stick with them and just watch the way it plays out but it's not just myself that struck it lucky this afternoon. Brent is also with Cheetah and would you know it he's with my favorite one. Yes, I thought Jamie might be a little bit jealous and uh, we are with Imani the daughter of Talek River. Sorry about that. It seems like there's a few gremlins living apart about this area. Uh, but my name is Brent Yosmith. I have Manu on camera. And for the between Manu and I big cats in the last in the next little while so obviously I was in the lead this morning with spotting the lions first and uh, Manu spotted the cheetah first but and uh, for the second time I'm gonna say sorry again she's quite hungry but there is a lot of game around here there's Thompson's gazelle and uh, Wildebeest. There's quite a lot of Tommies moving up there, Manu. Hopefully she spots them. <coughs> quite a lot of Tommies. And she's got a good approach through the thickets if she decides to go that way. So lots of potential dinner around. And as I said, she is quite hungry. The afternoon's getting cooler, so I am hoping she is going to start moving in the next little while. But while we wait for something to happen, let's go back across to G Well, our hyenas seem to have relaxed a little bit. There's no more... Ah. Okay, I just need to apologize you as... Apologize you. Oh my goodness, I'm too overexcited. Or at least too overwrought. Um... I need to apologize to you for the fact that we've been having some problems with our signal this afternoon. I'm pretty certain it's due to the storm. I've always had good signal in this area, but I think Brent's signal is a little bit shaky as well. So do forgive us. It's one of those things you might get the odd patches of black from us. Um, we will be back up and running and we are working on it. So the hyenas have calmed themselves down. No more tails up in excitement. I think they were looking to see if they could capitalize on the wildebeest to see if maybe they were panicked enough. 
but I've, they've given up on that idea. It's still quite, quite cool here, even though the sun is out and the wind is howling. So it's good hunting conditions for them, and there are five of them. Now I'm a bit torn because the cheetah are going into an area where we have signal, but it does start to get a little bit shaky. But I think let's go, let's go back towards the cheetah. Just these hyenas look look like they're up to no good but then hyenas always look like they're up to mischief now Josh you say is this a low ranking or a high ranking clan um, in terms of hierarchies within clans it's difficult for us to know because they are it depends very much on the size of the clan and they very regularly come into contact with each other and actually have battles with each other so in terms of hierarchy I don't think it's really possible to say this is a high ranking or a low ranking clan because they are it's dependent on numbers essentially and the circumstances of the day but in terms of individuals there is one very low ranked individual in this group and I could see it immediately from its body language. I say very low ranked, lower ranking than the rest of them. And in fact, where's it gone? There were five, I, I'm sure there were five. I counted five, but the fifth one's vanished. I don't know where it wandered off to. So there were five. Oh gosh, I think I'm in these people's way. Sorry, Craig, I'm just gonna go backwards a bit. They can't go off road. I think I just went and parked myself straight between them and their photograph of the hyena. Sorry chaps. Sorry, sorry. My sincerest apologies. You can't hear me, but I hope you take it from whence it comes. So, there is a, a lot of dominance and submission within this group. So, you'll see it with the tails up. Very, very excitable body language that we were seeing in the beginning. Now, it's difficult to tell exactly, without seeing the entire clan, where everybody fits in to a social hierarchy as complex as hyenas. As most of our regular viewers know, the females are always dominant, but within the grouping of the females, there are those that are dominant and there are those that are submissive. And status is hereditary to a point. See how that hyena on the right is lurking? not fully shy so not a hundred percent at the bottom of the pecking order but very much submissive to the hy the larger hyena and she is massive she's got a very round belly so we can safely say uh, uh, that she is higher ranking and I'm saying she gauging and judging by her size and I also think I can see quite enlarged nipples which could easily mean that she has cubs. Tricky to tell in this sort of light and at this sort of distance. Dave, it, where we are in the Mara, the, the clans are actually probably some of the largest that you get anywhere in the world. So it's not uncommon for clans here to be over a hundred hyenas strong. Something that we, with a sort of South African background, struggle to even comprehend. You've met most of the Juma hyenas, and that clan is probably just over 20 strong, give or take. But out here, the clans are enormous. Another very, very large hyena, and again, one of the more dominant ones, I would say. There we go. See, again... I think that that larger hyena is more is higher ranking than the one on the right. No sign of dominance. Kathy, it very much depends on the body language of the hyena from another clan. They very seldom do, but of course males occasionally do disperse and try and find their way into another clan. Often they are met with deep aggression, um, but they can sort of sit patiently on the outskirts and slowly, slowly, slowly integrate themselves into the clan itself. 
So a lot of hyenas stay with their clan that they are born into, but some do disperse and some do find their way into a different clan. Um, a foreign female will find herself in really big trouble and she could be quite badly attacked if, if perhaps on a border patrol a large group of females or a large group of hyena, doesn't have to be females, find a lone female from the neighboring clan, she could actually potentially be torn to shreds. Hyenas are not gentle with each other. We've seen one or two really, really serious fights. Gwen's, Gwen, the hyena back in South Africa, the one with the two younger cubs, she is right at the bottom of the pecking order when it comes to the Juma clan hierarchy. And she was once very badly attacked, not because she was a stranger, but just because she was a lower ranking female. She was attacked by the matriarch and the matriarch's daughter to the point that she tried to climb under our car to get away from it. It was that savage an attack. Plonk. Done. Done for the day. Let me just make Craig's life a little bit easier and then we can talk a bit more about hyena hierarchy. I do want to go and see where those cheetah have gone though in a little bit. Now Deadhead Tom, will a lower ranking female ever challenge a high ranking female? Yes. It does actually happen. There are what's almost termed a coup in hyena clans. So, within hyena clans, not all members are related to each other. So, if you think of it as sort of a family tree, you've got matrilineal lines. So, some uh, there'll be a female with her daughters and her daughter's daughters. They will be belong to one matri matrilineal line. Then you'll get another female and her daughters and her daughter's daughters and so on and so forth. And you can have several matrilineal lines within one clan. Now, sometimes what happens for whatever reason is that the dominant matrilineal line, so the matriarch and her daughters, uh, might be somewhat lacking in numbers and a lower ranking group is has got more numbers, they're related to each other, daughters, mothers, whatever it happens to be. And in sometimes in those situations you get a coup where the sub-ranking or the low-ranking females actually move up and they attack the matriarch and the higher-ranking females, often killing the matriarch, and they then establish themselves as the dominant group. Sometimes what happens is they split away. Uh, if, they don't, if there isn't a coup, they might split away. There might not be sufficient food. There might not be sufficient opportunity to raise their young. And they'll split away and they will start their own clan. So it's, it's a very complex thing, hyena society, and I'm not sure we really fully, totally understand everything that's happening. Now the wonderful news is that it seems like, fingers crossed, Brent has managed to fight off the gremlins. Let's go back and join him and, of course, the lovely Imani. Well, Imani is just lounging on the open grass plains at the moment. She is looking in the right direction towards where there's some Impala, Thompson's Gazelle, all very much within her range. Now, remember, if you have any questions on cheetahs, because so far it's a cheetah filled afternoon, as well as the spotted hyena, of course, hashtag Safari Live uh, on whatever platform you might be watching on, however you're. with the potential too far off and she is quite hungry and there are these quarry thickets between her and them which could offer her some nice cover as she stalks towards them but at the moment she's not looking too interested in hunting but her head is up and the afternoon is cooling now, not only are there Impala and Thompson's Gazelle, across the Gwari Thicket Valley, there are some Wildebeest, um, right up at the head and at the tail. There's actually quite a lot of game up there. More Tommies.
Hi, Joy. Joy is wondering why do some cheetah have names and some don't? Well, the ones who don't have names are in the process of probably getting names. And uh, so, Ima has names. But the others will be uh, getting names as their coalition develops. It's normally for ID purposes, from the researchers, why they get a name. Um, it's a bit easier to remember, um, or some re researchers prefer not to give names to animals and, and to keep it very scientific. So, for an example, some of the, uh, the researchers I've worked with before um, would name this cheetah, say this is the first cheetah we'd come across in, since we'd been in the Mara. This would be um, MM, Masai Mara, CH, cheetah, F, female. F for female, so MMCHF001. And then the next female will be double M, um, CHF002, and so on and so forth. Now, there are different naming systems. A lot of people like to give names. It is a bit easier to keep track than remembering double M, CHF001. Now she might also head down the valley. There's a big grouping of wildebeest and zebra. Kevo is wondering how old is she? I'm not 100% sure. Um, I'd say she's over two years old. Um, probably closer to three or four. Jamie might actually know her exact age. Uh, this is the first time I've ever seen her. So. Jamie has spent quite a bit of time with her before, so maybe Jamie knows her, her exact age. He said quite a lot of game all around, just not in the valley she's in at this very moment, but all around her. I'm pretty sure she is gonna get up and get on the move, hopefully in the not too distant future. Uh, sorry about into a now um Jamie says she's about six or seven, so an adult uh, female cheetah and she is quite gorgeous and let's hope she has a successful hunt this afternoon. As I just said, I do apologize for the breakup. Um, we are live from the African bush, so sometimes that does happen. Dear poor Brent doesn't seem to be able to fight off the gremlins this afternoon. I can't go to the cheetah until he does though, unfortunately, because if I go there then I vanish as well, and then we find ourselves with quite a serious problem. So there's the cheetah. On the other side of that dip I have signal, but in the dip I do not. Which means unfortunately we can't go to them yet. Uh, not until we're either joined by Juma or Brent's signal improves itself. Now, these are the sort of things that we have to juggle. What we could try and do is go around on the ridges. Maybe that'll work. Let's do it. Let's go around that way since the animals have all pretty much disappeared from this area. Rebecca... But... That's weird. Oh dear, what is going on? That is most unfortunate, apparently. Through the mud at the bottom there. So not long. Okay, let me try get up onto the ridge. Hopefully that will... Oh, 
Okay. Obviously, we really are struggling to battle off the gremlins, and not even being up here is working too well. So what we're going to do is we're going to go on to Tech Loop for now. So in other words, you know, where we sit and tell you that we have problems. We'll be back as soon as we've sorted everything out. We are sorry. And we are back and we do apologize for our break but we seem to have if not solved the problem certainly semi rectified it and it gave me an opportunity to go across the dip and catch up with our five cheetah boys now this poor guy was resting in the shade and then d'artagnan randomly walked up to him and batted him on the head and they had a little scrap the dynamics with these five boys are interesting and at this point, I don't think, I don't feel I know them well enough to really provide a full explanation. It was completely unprovoked. He was just lying in the shade. As soon as he saw Dart coming, he started squeaking and chirping. And Dart ran fully up to him and, and whacked him. I really don't fully understand what that was all about. He's one of the smaller ones. There's two larger ones, including D'Artagnan, who is the gentleman with the collar, and then there's two, three smaller ones, three younger ones. And we're still waiting to get exact clarification on their relationship to each other. But it was an interesting situation. Oh, Harry, I'm so sorry. I've been talking as if you've known these cheetah all your lives. Um, the five musketeers, not all of them have names. The one with the collar, who is the gentleman in the front there, I think. Yeah, he's the one walking. Oh, I can't see it now. He's the one walking in the front. Yeah, that's the one. He's got a, <coughs> a tracking collar on him, and that is to aid the researchers in terms of recording the data of a very, very unusual group of cheetah boys. His name is D'Artagnan, and he is the only one that has a name as far as we know, and as, as far as sort of researchers are concerned. I can guarantee that the rest of them all have names from guides. I can guarantee that there are different names depending upon who you ask. When we go with with names, we take our names from the Mara Cheetah Project. So that is who we speak to when it comes to the names of these individuals. I know Brent has already chatted about Imani. There's the interesting thing, thingamajig, is the ranking. And of course, let me just quickly discuss this. You will see there are other vehicles here. This is, of course, a tourist area where people come and enjoy these amazing sightings too. Quickly, Faith, can I move or am I going to cause absolute chaos if I move with the signal? Okay. All right, let's catch up with them. Um, so Thingamajig's wondering about the hierarchy. <laughs> Thingamajig, it's the name I call most things when I can't remember their names. Um, the hierarchy, I don't know if I would say that it is still being established or if it is in transition or if we just haven't realized who is more dominant. They fight all the time. They scrap over little things all the time. I don't know if that's common in a, a, a coalition of five cheetah. I've never seen a coalition of five cheetah before. This is very, very unusual. And a lot of people have speculated that they will split. I'm going to put myself out there and say that I don't think they will. I don't think they're going to split. I think one of them, you know, the, the, the drop in numbers could happen if one of them does die or, or something happens. So... I don't think we fully understand the hierarchy. I think D'Artagnan is the biggest, and I think that he is probably the more dominant for now. The other three males, the smaller three males, could easily catch up to him. I don't know exactly how old they are, but I suspect they are still growing. Well, the good news is that we're going uphill. So we should get better and better as we go along. We appear to be going towards Hammercorp now. I'm just going to zip past these people. 
So, in terms of hierarchy, I think Dart is dominant for now, and I think his disappearance was due to his due to his dominance because I think personally I will never know if this was true I think personally he went off to go and mate with a female that's what I believe so ladybug do I think that the cheetahs are rewriting the musketeers are rewriting the books on cheetah oh did you sit down you were walking so nicely in this direction where did you go That was unexpected. Sorry, I'll answer that in a moment. Okay. Vanishing Cheetah. I don't know if they are rewriting the book, but they're adding a chapter. And a couple of footnotes here and there. Where did they go, Craig? How did five Cheetah just disappear? Did they climb into the bush? I think they climbed into that bush. Are they, I wonder if they're still moving. Let's just get a little bit closer and we'll see. They're rewriting our understanding of how cheetah hunt to a degree, certainly mine, because they don't hunt. There we go. There they are, they've sat down. Let's just wait and see if they do stay sitting down or if they're going to get up again. I suspect they might hang out there for a little bit. They've certainly changed my perception on the way in which I understand cheetah hunt. I have always seen cheetah hunting. They're ambush predators almost. They stalk, they sneak up, they get as close as possible, and they speed off. And if they don't, if they're not successful, they stop and they lie down, and that's what they do. And they keep trying until they are successful. These boys and wildebeest, it's, it's what, like watching an entirely different species hunt. It, it's like a weird combination between lions and, and wild dogs it's almost as though they push and harass and push and harass and herd the herd the wildebeest until they spot a weak link what's up boy until they spot a weak link in the in the group and they go for it it's very very odd for us to see then there's the fact that there's five of them and the question of hierarchy comes into play who gets to mate with a female? It's not like being a lion, where you get lots and lots and lots of opportunities to mate with females. There's not that many female cheetah out there. Trust me, I know. I've tried to find Imani again when she's disappeared from, from my sight, and I've lost her. Never, I found her once and never again. So who gets to mate? Oh, goodness. Sorry, I just had to turn my radio down. I had it on far too loud while we were driving. Kevil, do they always hunt together? Yes, they do. Um, that's not to say that one might not catch one thing and one might catch another thing. Um, but all of the times that I've seen them, they always hunt together. They've mastered the art of social hunting. And they use each other very, very effectively. And when I watched them move towards the wildebeest this afternoon, I was watching the way that each one kept glancing across to the others, gauging their position, gauging their plan, working out who was going to go when. And one would go and then stop and be exhausted and rest. And then another would go and stop and be exhausted and rest. And they just go charging into the middle of the herd like maniacs. No, no regard for safety, no regard for, for, as far as I can see with my human eyes, really anything. They just barrel in. And there's chaos, and the wildebeest go scattering in every direction. Fascinating to witness. Kim, yes. When one cheetah grabs a wildebeest, the others divert their attention. And when I've seen them hunting, at least two of the closest ones go and help out the cheetah that's managed to catch something. But I have also seen them split up into three and two, where one caught one thing and the other two went to go and help it. And then the, the separate group of two actually continued to chase and to, to try and catch something else. So they do go and help. 
but they occasionally do split and divert their sort of focus their attention on a two different potential targets but yes absolutely they do they do go and help but i have seen an, one cheetah one cheetah take on an adult wildebeest and basically bring it under control not kill it but bring it under control before the others reached it and joined it wow some seriously bad weather to the north of us we've been so lucky i don't know i don't know how we managed to escape it i know that our weather looks perfect at the moment let's go and find out how brent's weather looks to the north of us oh dear faith don't cut don't cut i'm sorry my your comms are coming to me Okay, are we all good? Are we still live, Faith? <laughs> I'm sorry, I was trying to catch you before you before you cut. Sometimes our radios get confused. Okay, let's try that all again. We're going to send you across to Brent, who is to the north of us, and possibly has some cloudy skies in his direction. We do have a little bit of cloud above us. I think Jamie's still sitting happily in the sun. We also have a very, very flat cheetah still. Hopefully she will be on the move in the not too distant future. And uh, it's getting cooler and the wind's starting to pick up, which could also really aid her in her hunts today. It's always fascinating spending time with cheetah because you never know when they're quite going to hunt. Look at that, she looks very comfy. Adele is wondering, have I ever seen a in one of the hardest things to see out in the African bush. Um, cheetah, lion, very, yes. Marvelous, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to tell you that Brent's signal is still not stable, um, which is most unfortunate. It's obviously where the position of the cheetah is, and of course he wants to stick with her, but it doesn't seem to be working out very well. So unfortunately he has vanished once again. We apologize. We're still with our cheetah boys, and we're not going anywhere for the rest of the afternoon. We are going to sit with them. They are starving hungry, and we'll probably sit with them into the evening as well. We'll wait and see exactly what it is the scene. These males mating with a female. I'm not sure if anybody else has, but I have never seen them, and none of us at Safari Live have seen them with a female. D'Artagnan disappeared for a while during a time when all of them suddenly had limps, which led us to speculate, and it is speculation, that he had disappeared off, that they'd had a fight over a female, he had won, and he had stayed with her during the course of her estrus. I really think that's what happened, um, especially given their proximity to Imani at the time. Um, and there's quite a few female cheetah around here, so that is absolute, absolutely what I believe occurred. But we don't have any proof, and we don't know for certain. Was it D'Artagnan who disappeared? No, I can't remember. It was Dart. Sorry, everyone, I'm just checking around us. Umka, occasionally a wildebeest will come to the defense of another wildebeest when under attack. So they're not like a buffalo. They are not 
they're not going to go racing together with the entire herd moving to protect the individual that's been attacked so buffalo often fight off lions scare away lions it happens quite regularly but wildebeest do not however we have seen a wildebeest attack a cheetah before when with these boys when they caught a youngster probably the mother moved in and headbutted the male cheetah and actually sent him rolling head over heels so there are rare cases where that has happened but it doesn't often happen most of the time the wildebeest go into panic mode and i'm sorry i know the left the lapwings must be very audible it's because of the cheetah it's not because of us they are making you know, staring off in the direction of the cheetah and they keep squawking away sorry guys the predators in your vicinity what to do what to do yesterday it was the wattled lapwing today it's the crowned lapwing look could you look more indignant if you tried so unhappy i'm actually surprised they haven't started dive bombing them yet they're obviously not close enough yet yet there's dot he's just come out there we go. More movement from them. It's getting cooler. They're probably getting to the point where they've recovered from their failed hunt. Generally speaking, cheetah form coalition between brothers, so brothers from the same litter, occasionally, from what I understand, brothers from another litter, and very occasionally between cousins, so related cheetah. The reason there is usually that degree of connectedness is that there's usually, I'm sorry, I'm using a lot of sort of maybe words, but usually there is a hierarchy within cheetah coalitions where only one male will actually get the opportunity to mate and as a result it makes more sense for them to be closely related so that at least the male that doesn't get to mate is his time in terms of defending territory supporting his brother is well spent because at least 50 percent of his genetic material is being passed on even if he isn't the one doing the mating does that make sense usually as to how these five boys met it might have been something similar to what well, we don't actually know exactly how they related to each other we're waiting to find out but as for these let's say uh, if these boys came from two groups that were unrelated to each other and i would be hesitant to say that they're all five unrelated i would say that you had a group of two brothers the older two and a group of three brothers the younger the younger three but we don't know that for absolute certainty they could easily have formed a coalition in the way that young male lions form a coalition which was basically when they were young not quite at the do point of dominance found each other slay a little bit little way away from each other assessed each other growled at each other around a kill and eventually become friends that's the way that male lions form coalitions and it's basically it pays it pays to have the advantage of numbers as is very clear with these boys who have done so so well and of course the five of them are capable of chasing away a cheetah these five boys are very very good at chasing away hyenas lone hyenas that is Oh, we were talking about the cheetahs rewriting the book and um, or at least adding a chapter to it and Carlitz you want to know if the cheetah hunt at night these boys do so a lot of research has been done into and in fact one of the researchers here previously used to research cheetah in Botswana and a lot of the work that she did or papers that she wrote was on cheetah and their movements at night and naturally there was a large correlation between hunting on, at night and full moon night because we tend to think of cheetah as diurnal hunters they are more crepuscular hunters in other words morning afternoon but they you know 
That is in essence correct, but these boys move and hunt, and having followed them all night, all of us have, have stayed with them one night or another, in Scott's case several, they can cover distances of up to five, seven miles in one night, and they do hunt, and they hunt on moonless nights, completely moonless nights, or cloudy nights. So yes, they do hunt at night, despite what one might read on a very basic or in a very basic cheetah book. It's quite astounding. And they hunt the same way during the day and at night as well. The same idea. Just cause panic. Snivy, cheetah do not have a very long life expectancy in the wild. So, essentially, they will probably not live much longer than 10 years. A cheetah of 12 or 13 is really pretty old. Any older than that, and you, you know, you're really looking at an exceptionally long-lived cheetah. So they don't have particularly long life expectancies, probably due to the number of threats out here. So the older the cheetah gets, the obviously less sensitive their senses become, and the more vulnerable they become to attack by predators, other predators. Not quite as fast as they used to be, not quite as, um, what's the word, alert as they used to be. So quite a short life expectancy. In captivity, that life expectancy is much, much longer. And just in case you wondered where Brent's gone, well, unfortunately, he doesn't seem to have very good signal at all. Which is unfortunate because we, we've both come all the way across the river so that we can spend a lot more time with the cheetahs that we find here. Okay, fingers crossed what I just said was all nonsense and Brent has found signal again. Let's go back across to him and find out what Imani is, is up to. Well, there's a herd of Thompson's gazelle that are slowly moving towards Imani. They have not seen her yet. She has not moved since they came galloping over the hill. They're probably about 50 or 60 meters away. I think she's just watching quite carefully to see if there's any potential um, weakness. There's no babies in this herd. So it might not be a good herd for her to try. Well, that one does look like it's got a little bit of a limp. That one right at the back. And now there's also a male chasing females around but unfortunately for Imani he chased them in the opposite direction but maybe this is the, what we need to get her up and on the move now when a male ch look there, over there Imani when a male chases a female like this, they inadvertently chase them in all sorts of directions and can often accidentally chase them into waiting death. There's the female who's been trying to escape the attentions of the male. Now she's going to try and move back towards the little herd. There's the male. He's about to set off, I think, again, chasing her again. She, she's trying to head back towards the herd. Debbie from Vancouver is wondering how close the cheetah is to the Thompson's gazelle. Debbie, as I said, probably about 50 meters or so. And they haven't noticed her yet. However, look at that. That one's getting even closer. Now, she hasn't shown any sign that she's about to get up and attack. I think she's worried about giving away her position. Unless something gets very, very close to her. Now, 
Let's see, is that Tommy going to spot her or just keep walking closer and closer? Now, you might have heard some zebras calling. There are also some zebras moving into this area. And I thought I heard a wildebeest or two as well. But she's not looking like she's about to spring at all. I think she's worried they're just that little bit too far away from her. That by the time she gets up and gets going, they'll be long, long gone. Lisa says that's so close. Indeed it is, Lisa. But as I say, the Tommies are very fast. And if she stands up and gives away a position, that the Tommies will be able to get away from her. They'll have enough distance. Now it's gonna be interesting to see what happens when the zebras move towards her as well because on the line they're walking they're almost certainly going to spot her and I can't see any young zebras and they're certainly too big for her to take on but they are slowly moving directly towards her as well As soon as we saw those Thompson's gazelles moving in a direction, we moved further away. Make sure we don't interfere. Snivy is wondering, do the gazelles have bad eyesight? Not at all, but their eyes are designed to pick up movement and so she's not moving on purpose. So they don't know that she's in this area. So here we go, you can see the zebras particularly the zebra down below, looks like it might walk straight into where she is. We'll see when they see them. Sorry about the gremlins, folks. They seem to be invading this area at the moment. There's that zebra heading straight towards her. Yeah, but more as well. Okay guys, apologies again for the breakup. And that zebra is getting much closer to where Imani is lying at the moment. And she's keeping very, very still not wanting to let her presence be known. It's often quite funny when zebra suddenly spots a predator that's been lying in So we go, you can see that zebra is going to walk behind her. I think she might be in luck, no one's going to spot her. Well, Amani pretends to be a log. Let's go see what the musketeers are up to. They're sleeping. They have not moved since you left us and went across to Brent. So the musketeers are resting after, you know, I don't know how long they were actually moving around those wildebeest. I suspect it probably started just after the storm finished, which would have been about an, they would have been at it for about an hour or so, if that was the case. So they, they've probably really truly exhausted themselves for now. And they're ashamed, they're so hungry, they really are quite empty bellied, they could use a good meal. But they just know that there's no point to even trying that wildebeest herd again. 
So as to what they're going to do now, well, your guess is as good as mine. I can't see, oh no, I can't see wildebeest, I think. Are those wildebeest? Let me find my binoculars. Those have just appeared if they are. They are not wildebeest, they are tommies. I doubt they're going to bother actively hunting tommies. All the way in the background there. I don't think that they're going to bother. Oh, there's the leopard face nest. Do you see the, the leopard face on the right of your screen in the gardenia? I discovered that nest site last time I was here with the musketeers because they love that gardenia. They absolutely, it's one of their favorite scent marking spots. <laughs> so the leopard faced vultures have a nest there and they find themselves repeatedly annoyed by the scent marking cheetahs. Now, I don't think the musketeers are going to waste their energy on a Tommy. And the reason that I say that is not because they wouldn't hunt a Thompson's. I mean they wouldn't actually actively go and try and hunt a Thompson's. If, as we've seen before, one were to come sprinting out in front of them, then absolutely. Then they do go racing off and they do grab them. But they're not a, a little tiny Tommy antelope. Oh, look at their tails. And the more you look at it, the more that looks like they're all wagging in an exact motion or to an exact time they're like little metronomes but I don't think a Thompson's gazelle is really much of a meal it's more of an appetizer for the musketeers all five of them together feeding off one Tommy there's not all that much meat to go around Lovely to hear from Scarlett, who has become a regular name over our past few safaris. Now, Scarlett, I don't know exactly what the population of a cheetah is in the Mara. We can try and do, an, uh, we can work it out in the in the 160 acres that we, acres, 160,000 hectares that we drive around in. So we've got the five musketeers, the two Hammercorp boys, the two border boys and let's add one or two extra males so we're looking at 12 or so males we've got Kakenya, Kakenya's two daughters, Armani, Imani, Armani's two daughters bit confusing that, Malaika, her two boys so now we're on 10 females let's say 15 females so let's round up and say that we've got over 15 males and over 15 females in our traverse area and I'm rounding up because I don't think we know uh, I haven't counted Musiara, I haven't qu counted Miali I haven't counted somebody else I haven't counted Hoduri these are all cheetah that you haven't really had that much of an opportunity to get to know so let's say that we've got about on average 35 cheetah wondering about 35 to 40 cheetah in between the Mara Triangle and the Mara National Reserve that is not counting the conservancies but bear in mind that there are no fence fences between Kenya and Tanzania or at least no fences in the Mara there's no border between those two countries and there's no border between the reserves and the conservancies so the conservancies I don't know I'm not I I haven't been into any of the conservancies except briefly in passing and they are enormous so I don't know what how many cheetah there are in, in Mara North or Naibosho for example but that would be my guess in the traverse area that we spend time in the Mara Triangle and the Mara National Reserve and the nice thing about this area is that it really is a very very good place for cheetah I I think that was probably not as profound as it sounded in my head. Let me try and rephrase that. The conservancies in particular are great for cheetah because there tend to be fewer lions. Not not that much though, their lions are still there. But it's such a perfect habitat for them. It's difficult for lions to sneak up on them. So essentially it is one of the best places in the world to come and see cheetah is basically where I was going with that very secure relatively stable cheetah population which is lovely which is very very special
Robert, not really. So Robert's asking about female cheetah and if they will fight for territory. They are naturally solitary cats and they will get irritated and possibly aggressive with each other if they encounter each other. But that doesn't really mean that they're fighting over territory. So cheetah, female cheetah in particular have enormous home ranges and a territory is, is something that an animal defends. A home range is, some, is an area that an animal moves about in. Now, generally speaking, female cheetah don't have territories. They might be a bit more aggressive around the borders of an area if they've got cubs. Perhaps they're feeling defensive over those cubs. But aggression between female cheetahs is rare. A lot of the time it's because they never see each other. The chances of them encountering each other, it's like two little atoms bouncing about in the universe and, and happening to collide. The chances are pretty slim. Okay, not quite that slim. That was a slight over-exaggeration. But it's this massive area with very, very few female cheetah. So what ha tends to happen is they cover enormous amounts of ground. Malaika, when I first saw her, was north of the Tulik River, close to Musiara. The next time I saw her, she was at Ashnell's camp, which is all the way down south, probably about 25-odd kilometers in a straight line. At the same time, I have seen the daughters of... Oh, and now she's back at, at Double Crossing, by the way. Same time I've seen the daughters of Armani. Not Imani, Armani. Imani is the daughter of Armani, and I'm talking about her younger sisters. I've seen them at Double Crossing. So the, the cheetah, female cheetah territories are not really something that's properly established or uh, or fought for. Which makes finding them very difficult, as you can imagine. Which is why I never managed to find Imani ever again, and I was deeply devastated by that. The reason I loved her so much was because, or I love her so much, was the first and only time I ever saw her. She walked up to us, promptly caught a rock, flicked it into the air, and then looked at us as if to say, yeah, I caught a rock. What, you, what do you have to say about it? She sort of, if it was possible for an animal to grin, she grinned. She also played with guinea fowl, and when we put our covers down in the rain, when we opened the little window that we have, she'd snuck up from where we'd left her and was sitting on a termite mount right next to us, looking into the window, trying to see what we were doing. So she's really cool. She's <laughs> complete weirdo. I like that about her. And she's actually the only female cheetah that I've spent a few hours with. So I really enjoy her. She was almost flirtatious with us. Kathy, I don't necessarily there are so think that there are so few female cheetahs when compared to males. Um, it's just that the males are easier to find because they've got set territories, especially these boys. Um, since I went away two weeks ago, this this was the area I was finding them in before, and this is the area that they are in now, and. Um, uh, they haven't moved very far at all, whereas a female cheetah, as I said, is almost nomadic. So it's not that there are less cheetah, it's just that they are harder to find. Cheetah in general, there are not that many of them left in the world. It's a very sad fact of life that they are a species in decline, despite best efforts to keep them safe. And there is an argument, not my argument, that there is an argument that it's actually it's nature's selection as well, that the cheetah is one of nature's failures. It can't adapt, it's very highly specialized, and that it was due to go extinct regardless of human interference. Naturally, that theory has to acknowledge the fact that we have hastened, as a species, we have hastened the departure of cheetah due to encroachment and, and hunting and so on. So you get the idea. That, that is a theory that is out there. Um, they are very, they are not very genetically diverse animals. Um, they are all exceptionally similar to each other, which means they don't have much in the way of resilience to changing conditions. Genetic diversity is a very good thing in an animal species.
Tim, the explanation behind the lack of diversity within cheetah populations is the idea that long ago, I think it was tens of thousands of years ago, I can't remember exactly when it was set, but let's just say before you and I were born, let's put it that way, a very long time ago there was a some kind of crash in the cheetah population, possibly due to disease, possibly due to changing climatic conditions, whatever happened to cause it. They were left with left with very, very few cheetah in the world, and that all of the cheetah that we see now are descendants from that population bottleneck. So essentially when the cheetah population was very, very, very small. Now, of course, the cheetah population is still very, 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 very small. So there are not many options in terms of breeding, and there's no, there's no real possibility of diversification. Interestingly, I mean, you know, the cheetah are so similar to each other that you could graft skin from one to the other and they should be fine. That is how similar we're talking. Interestingly, every po pretty much every single rhino in South Africa comes from a time when the rhino was just saved from extinction in South Africa and there were maybe 60, 70 individuals left. And that was not that long ago. Now there's 20,000 odd white rhino. But essentially the population was very small, but they don't struggle from that same lack of diversity. So the population bottleneck must have gone on for a considerable period of time with the cheetah. Just an interesting thought. I'd often, I often think of that fact when I think of cheetahs and genetic diversity. There's probably more than meets the eye to that, scenario, that situation. Oh, shame. Poor sleepy boys. Sorry, saying shame is a very South African thing. It is a South African habit I have never managed to break. Doesn't matter what's going on, I'm going to say shame. I'm not feeling well, shame. Oh, shame, the cheetah are tired. I'm hungry, oh, shame. It, it's a very South African thing, we can't help it. It's ingrained within us. So when I say shame, just take it from whence it comes. That along with just now, 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 and... What's the other one? Just now, 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 and... Just now, 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 in a little bit. Yeah, we use just now to mean future, not a little bit back into the past. Our amazing English ability. <laughs> Great news! I mentioned at the start of our safari that we would be joined by our team back in South Africa. Uh, now that the temperatures have started to cool this afternoon, James is out and about and he would love to say hello. Please don't go. <laughs> the sunset safari we're sitting here with an enormous elephant bull and a special welcome to the children of white oaks elementary school aged just six and seven years old my name is james henry that elephant there doesn't in fact have a name and on camera today we have got vium the wildebeest aka the long thumb with us today you can ask us as many questions as you like while we're sitting here in your classroom. Well, you're sort of sitting with me here in Africa, and it's lovely to have you here. Right, so there is the elephant. We're going to move along a little bit closer to him, but while we do that, Brent Leo Smith in the Maasai Mara has got hunting cheetah. Welcome, everyone. We are with Imani, the female cheetah. She's changed position and she's about to pounce towards some Thompson's gazelles. I think it's ready for our action group to join us. 
Look at her, how she's bunching up, getting ready to shoot. The gazelles don't know she's there. They're slowly moving closer and closer. Now oh, there is a young one amongst there. She might target that. There are the gazelles. Happily feeding away, unawares that there's a cheetah close by. Now, welcome, welcome everyone live to the Masai Mara in Kenya. We are with a female cheetah named Imani who's slowly sneaking up towards a herd of Thompson's gazelles. They are unaware she's there. There they are. And she's quite hungry. And they are getting within her strike range now. You can just see how she is keeping very low to the ground. And her eyes are locked on those gazelles. And every now and then you'll see her muscles just move and she might creep forward an inch or two she wants them ideally to be as close as possible unless she spots a little bit of weakness in the herd there's only one sub adult in the herd of gazelles this is very very exciting remember this is a hundred percent live from Kenya and if you want to ask me a question about what's going on. ...from you. ...Mara in Kenya. ...Bush. Sometimes we do experience a few technical difficulties. There's some very big storms around this evening. I actually saw some big lightning just beyond where those gazelles are. Now she could shoot from there at any second. The gazelles are getting closer and closer. Now you've got to be very patient while watching animals hunt. And patience is king. Sorry about that, guys. You can see the gazelles are inching closer and closer. Still none the wiser that there is a cheetah lurking. And the wind is blowing from left to right, so they're not going to smell her. The closer they get to those little bushes, the more dangerous it is for them. as low to the ground as possible trying to wait till they're close enough Brenda is one of the female There, I'm just going to try quickly. So I'm, we're going to end now. I'm going to say goodbye quickly. I'm going to try to get into a better position where hopefully we don't have any picture breakup. So bye. We'll be back now. now.
Okay, we're trying to just get into a spot where there are no gremlins. Can you still see her from here? My on top of a little bit of high ground, but I can't see her from here. You see her? Not yet. Okay, we're just trying to get a spot where we can see her and the gazelles without getting too close to interfere. Let's just have a quick look from here. Where is she? So we've, we've lost sight of her from here. But she is close. Where has she gone? She's just keeping so flat to the ground. In my binoculars, let me try and have a look with my binos. So there's a zebra, so she should be behind there. I think oh, it seems like there's a lot of gremlins in this area. Um, I'm gonna try one more thing, I'm gonna try get up higher up the hill above behind there she is well spotted Manu great spot by Manu there can just see her ears flicking okay so we know where she is which just come out wide for me so I can see exactly which bush because I'm a bit lower I'm gonna try this Above the Thompson's gazelles, higher on the on the crest. Sorry about that. Brent has vanished off your screen. He is battling with some really serious weather conditions that have blown in. But we're on our way to take you back towards those cheetah. But while we get there, let's send you back over to my colleague and friend in South Africa, Tristan, who has not yet, I don't think, said good afternoon. Good afternoon to, from a very hot, very sunny warm Juma Game Reserve in South Africa. My name is Tristan and on camera today I've got Sebastian and it is a very 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 warm welcome especially to White Oaks Elementary. I hope that you're going to have a wonderful afternoon with us as we explore all the lovely things that we see out here in the African wilderness. Now you may have seen that there was a few eggs that were on the ground and this egg well these three eggs that we see here unfortunately are in the sun and the adult who was here is a crowned lapwing it's a type of bird that likes to nest on the ground and they like to build their nests in places where it's very difficult for us to actually see them they've got incredible camouflage now camouflage is a word that we use for when things are very well hidden so the pattern on the eggs are exactly like those that you see on the ground and so the eggs blend in incredibly well and it's very difficult for a predator or even someone like to be able to find them with the camera so it is amazing to see these little nests and how they build their nest is they'll use their chest and they'll sit down and then they wiggle their chest like as though they're like a little wriggly worm and that makes a little shallow bowl and they then lay the eggs inside there and they'll sit on these eggs 
for about 25 to 28 days and from there the little chicks will hatch and within four hours these little chicks are moving around with the adults so it's an incredible process the problem is is that because the nest is on the ground there's so many predators that can get these eggs so things like um, white-tailed mongoose even things like an elephant might be able to stand on those lots of different little predators unfortunately and so this poor adult has to look after them and really try and make sure that these eggs are well protected. Now White Oaks Elementary, you want to know if we're in the dry or the wet season. Well, we're kind of in between. So we've just come out of our winter, which is the really dry, dry season for here for us here in South Africa. But we are going into our summer season, which means that it's going to be rain coming soon. And with hot weather like we're having today, we're going to have a situation where we're going to get a lot of heat causing evaporation of water. And evaporation means that the water turns from a liquid. So like we know, to be into a gas and that gas then rises up and it goes into the clouds and the clouds then start to form and it's able to then rain and so the rain will come and that's why you're seeing that the grass is very very short but it's got a nice green tinge to it and that green has only come about in I would say the last three weeks and we had a bit of rain about a week ago and that really made everything a lot greener than what it was so we're going into our rainy season now and it promises to be a wonderful time it's always a time of plenty I'm going to start moving now because it is quite hot in this area and I'll also I want the parent to come back because those eggs in this baking sunshine is not very good they can get too hot and therefore kill the chicks so we want to move off so that the adult can come and lie down and we don't disturb this nest any further now our plan for this afternoon is we're going to try and see if we can find some of the bigger animals at the water holes while it's still so hot we're going to try and head down to a place called treehouse dam and that's a lovely place for elephants and buffalo and so we're going to get it maybe get a chance to find some of those things down in that area I love elephants and because it's warm elephants will always try and go to Towards water to go and cool off and so they drink a lot of water then they'll splash and they'll throw it on their ears and sometimes they'll even swim if it's very warm so maybe we'll get lucky this afternoon that's the kind of plan anyway I think we'll be fortunate if we find things like the cats because it's still very warm they will probably be hiding in the shade because it's still too hot for them they normally come out a little bit later in the day So White Oaks Elementary, you're wondering what do elephants eat? Well, elephants eat pretty much all that we can currently see right now. So everything that you see around me is basically what the elephants will eat. They eat grass, they eat roots, they eat bark, they eat leaves, so trees, bushes, grasses, anything like that is what they'll go after. They'll even eat fruits and so they eat a lot of different things and the reason why is because they're such big animals if they only ate one thing it would be very difficult for them to be able to find that amount of food and so what they have to do is they have to mix their diet and they basically eat like a mixed salad and so they go for grass and then they'll go for a bit of leaves and then they'll go for a bit of roots and then they'll just kind of balance it along as they go so it takes them a lot of time to feed and they and they feed for most of the day in fact in hot weather like this you'll find that they'll try and probably rest now and then they start to go for water and after water then we'll start to see them going out and feeding and they'll even feed into the night when it's very warm like this but hopefully like I say we will be able to find one they are around at the moment and and like I say they do move quite a bit to find food and so the best places to check is in around the water now there's a beautiful bird that's here that's got a looks like it's got something in its beak what is that it seems as though it's caught itself a beetle look at that so it's got itself a dung beetle this is amazing so what happened is this lilac breasted roller is its name it's the most beautiful bird that we've got here it's got bright colors you'll see it's got lilac and these turquoise colors all over it's managed to catch itself a beetle that we call a dung beetle now dung beetles come out in the summer and they look for balls of elephant dung like what we were talking about the elephants eat a lot of food and they also then will poo a lot of food and so these dung beetles go towards the elephant poo and then things like those birds come and grab them but that's a massive meal for that lilac breasted roller and super cool to see it's not every day that we get to see them eating those wonderful stuff being spoiled this afternoon by being able to see that now I'm hoping that as I go down this dip 
that there's a nice shady kind of river area and that should be a good place to start our search for the afternoon then from there we're gonna go up a little bit onto the hill and then down the hill on the other side there's a nice water hole and that's hopefully where we're going to find some interesting things having a little afternoon drink well that's what I hope anyway I'm sure you're all very excited to see lots of the animals and various other things out here in the African wilderness Now we've just got to be slow down a little bit over some of these bumps so these bumps are all made to be able to stop water from damaging our road so now we're talking about going into the wet season when it rains a lot and so when the road is very steep you have to have bumps like this to be able to stop the water and to push the water back into the bush and make sure that our roads stay in good condition so I have to slow down otherwise I will lose Sebastian but while I negotiate these big bumps and while I try and get over here safely without losing Sebastian let's go across to I think is James, my friend James, who's also here in South Africa, but it could be Jamie. Their names are very confusing over the radio, so I hope it's James, but I'm sorry if it is Jamie. Well, yes, it is James, not Jamie, and we are just going to have a quick look at some water buck over here. And the mongoose, where is the mongoose? Oh, there's a mongoose in here. Can you see it still? Now, the mongoose is very special little predator, the smallest predators we have here. Shall I go forward or backwards? I can hear birds going telling us that there is a mongoose in there which will try and eat them if he can catch them. Anyway, we'll leave the mongoose because they're very good at hiding. They disappear underneath all of the vegetation and we'll have a look at some water buck. There they are. Of course, because the car is noisy and it smells. There they are. See the beautiful colors of the green spring or early summer leaves and the gray of the waterbuck. And you know, a waterbuck's most, I think, lovely characteristic is that they smell a little bit like horses. Like horses mixed with a, you know that nice smell, I don't know if you've ever had a wood fire in your home, or you've ever had a barbecue when your parents have made you uh, your supper with a barbecue, That you know that comforting smell? Well, that's what they smell like. And this chap is, or this cow, she's quite old, obviously has run through many many different kinds of bushes you can see her ears are torn there they've been ripped by thorns see that that's an indication that she is old she is not young anymore and it means that she spent years running through the bushes here trying to get away from lions and hyenas and that's torn her ears over the years now, Jim, you want to know if waterbuck are related to deer. Well, they are related, but they're not closely related. Deer, we don't really get in Africa. We only get one species of deer in Africa, and that's up in the Atlas Mountains. And that's a long, long, long way away from where we are now. That's further than the distance between Virginia Beach and Malibu, for example. It's further than that. So we do get one species of deer, one kind of deer here in Africa, but it's so far away from here. These are called antelope, and so they are much more closely related to impala, to those Thompson's gazelles you were looking at with Jamie and Brent, and to wildebeest, and that sort of thing. I just want you to look once more at that old cow in the front. You can also tell she's old by how thin she is. Can you see how skinny her neck is? She also looks like she's going grey, doesn't she? See the hair on her neck there? Ah, she looks like she's had a good life, but that it might be quite close to its termination. That means I don't know how long she's going to live for. I'm sure she's a granny many times over. 
attempt. She's obviously very tough to have made it this far. They can probably live sometimes for up to 15 years. And I think that she is probably quite close to around 12 or 13. So that doesn't, it's not a very long time, is it? When you think that you all, hopefully, will live to well over 90 years old. And look, she's even limping. I would imagine by the time that you youngsters get to old age, it will be expected that human beings should live for a hundred years. By then, we haven't wiped ourselves out, of course. Now, they're looking into the bush in one direction. And you know, there's normally only one reason that they would do that. They think there's some danger in there. Ah, they can see a stien book. Now, I'm sorry, kids, I missed your last question, Faith. Could we have it again, please? Something about their ears. They can see another little antelope in there, we think. Oh, you say, does it hurt that when their ears get torn? I'm sure it hurts very much. In the same way, I mean, I tell you what, why don't you all grab your hold of your ear, hold your left ear, and take your nail, and push your nail into the top of your ear, and see how hard you can pinch. And I bet you can't pinch very hard, because it gets very sore, doesn't it? I'm just doing it to myself now. Ow! And I imagine that the pain for the water buck must have been very similar. But she's old now. I think she also might have a disease known as mange. You can see her fur is not very... Well, it's not in very good condition. That means that she's got bare patches, it's quite thin. That happens with age as well. Oh yes, they're just watching a little antelope about the size of a... Ooh, what kind of dog? It's about the size of a, a sort of large terrier walking through the bush there. He's in there somewhere. Have you see him there? He's a sort of reddish, russet-coloured antelope, tiny little thing. All right, Jamie's five cheetah brothers are on the move. We're going to head up behind us and see if we can't find another spotted cat for you. Hopefully we'll be lucky before we see you next. Spotted cats galore, what a fantastic day it is. So while James goes off in search of his, at least we've got five here to show you. And they are up and moving once again. They've had their rest after a couple of failed hunting attempts. And now they are walking right by us and very happily they are walking in the right direction. I was very concerned they were going to take us in the opposite direction away from good signal. But they're taking us up the ridge and in fact potentially back towards that herd of wildebeest. Hopefully they don't do that though because those hyenas I'm sure are still there. And hello to the kids joining us from White Oaks Elementary. Now you want to know how fast a cheetah can run. Now a cheetah can run 70 miles per hour, so over 120 kilometers. Now that's really, really fast. That's as fast as you might drive when you drive on, well not you in particular, but when your parents drive on a motorway or a highway, when you go as fast as you can in the car, that is how fast the cheetah can run but they can only run that fast for a short period of time so you know when you run on the playground or in a field or wherever you happen to run about you know when you run and you run as fast as fast as fast as fast as you can you probably can't run all that far even if you're running at your fastest now a cheetah is kind of the same cheetahs get really tired when they've been running that fast okay let's go catch up with them our signal will still be absolutely fine there now what you're seeing for the kids that have joined us what you're seeing is really unusual you 
don't often get to see five cheetah at once. This is the only group of five cheetah that we know about. They are very, very interesting animals. So what I think they're going to do now, if I had to predict, I think they're going to go to that tree that's up ahead and I think they're going to go and scent market. Now how many of you have dogs at home that are a little bit naughty and often urinate inside? How often do they pee inside or on the curtain or on the couch? So this is what the cheetah are going to do except this is the whole world is their home so it doesn't matter if they do it. They don't have to be house trained. Now they're going to go and quite possibly urinate on that tree. That's what I think they're going to do. So the more time we spend watching them, the more we learn about their favorite places. And I've already learned about certain trees that they really, really like. I haven't seen them at this tree before, but it looks like that's what they plan to do because it's right in the middle of their territory. Here we go, walking, sniffing around it. Now, while our cheetah move about and mark their territory, earlier on they were hunting for their dinner. Now, White Oaks Elementary wants to know what do cheetah eat? Cheetah eat meat. They have to eat meat. That is what they are designed to catch and to eat. So, they eat wildebeest, they eat Thompson's gazelle, which is a type of antelope, they eat impala, they eat scrub hares, which is a type of hare, very similar to a rabbit, but just slightly different. Oh, bumping heads there. Here we go, see? Scent marking, spraying their urine back onto the tree. So, a cheetah will eat whatever it can catch. So as long as they're big enough and strong enough to catch an animal, they will eat that animal. But a lot of the time they don't manage to actually eat what they've caught because it gets stolen from them. Well, there's lots of animals here that would like to steal from a cheetah. One is a hyena, the other is a lion. Lions often steal from cheetah. And in fact, where we are, I've actually seen them being chased away by a lioness before and stole their kill. So that's what they're thinking about now. They're scent marking, but they're also thinking about a dinner. You can see they're quite thin. See how their bellies move up towards their back legs? That tells us that they're a little bit hungry. And the fact that they were trying so hard earlier today means that they are definitely in search of something to eat. Now, which way are they going to lead us? That is the next question. White Oaks Elementary, all the kids joining us? No, a cheetah can't eat an elephant. So a cheetah is not big or strong enough to eat an elephant. They cannot do it. They will not be able to catch an elephant. Okay, let's catch up with the cheetah. So an elephant is much, much too big for cheetah, even five cheetah. The only animal that could really catch an elephant is a lion. And that's because lions work together in groups. They are, the females are about three times the size of the cheetah, or almost three times the size of the cheetah. The males are even bigger. What's going on, boys? They're lying down again. Sometimes they fight a little bit between the different members of this group. Yeah, they're going to have a fight. Again, a little bit of a scrap. Now, you can't hear it because the wind is howling, but the cheetah that was the one that was attacked, he's making noises, going, ow, ow. He's chirping. That's the sort of noise that, that cheetah make. They make chirping noises. So that wasn't a serious fight. It was just a little bit of a scrap, almost a playful scrap, between the five boys. And it, interesting, that's the second time that's happened today. Very, very interesting. Okay, boys, where are you taking us? Oh, 
very very good question from white oaks elementary now you guys are wondering what is the difference between the spots on a leopard and the spots on a cheetah so the difference is that on a cheetah the spots are solid almost circles so they're solid on a leopard a leopard spots are actually called rosettes and that's because they're made up of a couple of different spots joined together with an open patch in the middle so that's why leopard spots are called rosette rosettes and hopefully the guys in South Africa because you're in Kenya at the moment but hopefully James or Tristan managed to find you a leopard and then you can compare the two yourselves because I don't think I have a actually no I do have a picture for with me okay let's catch up with the cheetah and then I'll show you a picture of what a leopard's spots look like hold on a minute and keep watching them see where they're going there's a gazelle over there but the gazelle's seen them so I don't think they're gonna try and go for it let's just stop here there's some topi off in the dif distance that's a different type of antelope they might try and go for a topi let me quickly quickly find a picture for you there's the topi looking at them Where have all my leopard pictures gone? So, if I zoom in on a picture of a leopard, so it's a little bit blurry, but just quickly. There we go. See what I mean about how the spots join together to make almost like circles. That's what leopard fur looks like. That's what leopard spots look like. Whereas, have a look at the cheetah when we get a bit closer. There we go. See how different it is? They look like somebody's just put dots on them. Stamped dots on them. So that's what cheetah spots look like and that's what leopard spots look like. Leopards are also... Can't turn the key. Leopards are also much stockier and stronger than cheetah. Cheetah are long and thin like runners are. Still can't turn the key. Trying to unlock the... <laughs> White Oaks Elementary. Cheetah tend to have quite large litters. So they will have up to five cubs at a time and the reason they have so many litter, so many cubs at one time is because they often don't survive to adulthood so it's really really difficult for a cheetah to raise cubs all the way to adulthood I can't turn the ski <laughs> my car is broken <laughs> Why is it always me? Bye cheetah. Have a nice life. It's just because. Come on. This is not my car by the way. It is Scott's car. <laughs> There's nothing I can do. There's literally nothing I can do. Don't mind me. I'll just keep trying. Ah. Oh. Great. <laughs> I give up on this day. Please just turn, please, please. The good news is, is that there's literally nobody else to go to either. <laughs> I tried turning the wheels, unlocking it just enough to turn the key. Oh, oh, oh! And we're off! Whee! We're back up and running. It had to happen at some point. Something had to give. 
It's either going to be my wrist bone or the key. Fortunately, both my radius and ulna are still in one place and all the little bones are too. Okay, we're going to catch up with our cheetah, find out where they go. While we do that, let's send you back across to Tristan in South Africa so that I can give the car a jolly good hiding. Well, what a wonderful thing to see. Five cheetahs, the most magical thing, and I'm very jealous that Jamie has managed to find those five cheetah. And so we checked our little water hole, and fortunately there was no sign of anything. It was just barren and hot, and no sign of any tracks or anything to work with. So now we've come up to our northern section, just to have a little look around, and just to see maybe we get lucky with something on this side. There's not too much water in this area, but we do have a situation. Oh, hello. That's interesting. So what I have got is quite nice. Now I've just got to get my car into reverse so that I can show you. But over here, there are tracks for lions. So I'm going to just position myself that Sebastian can be able to show you those tracks. So Seb, they're in there. There we go, Sebastian can see them. Now these tracks I know are for lions because of the size of these tracks. So the size are very, very big. It's not a small print at all. I'm going to try and get my hand there so that you can see just how big this track is. So there's my hand in comparison to the lion track. And the reason why I know it's a lion track is other than the size is because of a few things on the foot that they have that other cats might not have or other animals might not have so the first thing is at the back here we have three lobes one two and then a third lobe at the back now that is indicative of all cats so all cats have those three lobes what they do have as well is rather big toes so there's the one two three four toes their fifth toe is actually up here and it's called a dew claw and it's right up on their wrist itself it's not on the paw itself so you'll only see four toes when a cat stands the other thing is is that there's no claws anywhere in this particular section which means that if there's no claws then it's not a hyena or a dog because dogs always have their claws out lion and leopards they have their claws in now Jamie's cheetah is a bit of a different one because Jamie's cheetah in the tracks that she would have for those cheetah there would be claws because the cheetah needs those claws to be out all the time so that it can have some stability or some strength and to be able to grip when running so it's like if you any of you have run on an athletics track you'll see that sometimes you wear shoes with little spikes on them and and that's to be able to grip when you're running and the lions and leopards they use their claws more from catching food and so those have to be very very sharp and if they had them out all the time they'd become very blunt now these tracks are from sometime during today maybe early this morning that they crossed this way so I'm going to try and see if I can find these lions I'm pretty sure it's our pride that we see the most which is called the Inkuhuma pride and the Inkuhuma pride is five adult lionesses and then they've got six cubs that are over a year old and two brand new little cubs that are about four months old so nice pride to see and hopefully they will be somewhere in this particular section So the problem though is if we have a look on our right hand side and you'll see that this area is very very thick it looks very different to where Jamie is and so the lions go into here for shade and hot days like this and it makes it a lot more difficult to be able to find them than the way that Jamie does it and so what we have to do is we sometimes have to track these animals now when I say track what that means is that I will have to get off and follow the footprint and try and keep looking for the footprints as they move through until we can try and find these cats I think though that these tracks are probably going to come out in a different place and so before I go off on foot to try and find them I have to go and check all the areas to the north of here to make sure that these cats haven't gone out of this particular section because otherwise I'm going to waste my whole time to try and get up into that area but I would think that these cats if they walked here early this morning 
hopefully have found somewhere where they wanted to lie down to just have a little bit of a sleep. It's been very warm today and generally leopards, I mean, and lions and, and cheetah, they don't really like to walk around too much in the heat. They have a thick fur coat and it means they get very, very hot. And so normally the lions, they like to find somewhere, they lie down and then they'll start walking only when it gets a little bit darker. So when that sun comes down, that's when they'll start to move around and try and hunt and try and to actually find food for the evening. So White Oaks Elementary, you're wondering how we find the animals when we're driving around. Well, the one way is how I just told you. So when we track the animals, which is like I say, here in South Africa, we're very lucky that we have nice soft roads that easily show footprints. And so I can follow the footprints and see where they go and try and find the animal by using where their feet go. So wherever they step, they're going to leave a marking. So if you go at home, try and find somewhere with a nice little bit of sand and go and put your foot in the sand and then lift your foot up and you'll see that your foot makes a mark. And things like lions and leopards and cheetah and elephants and all these animals, they leave the same markings behind for us. Once we know what the marking is, so if we know what a lion's foot looks like, then we can follow those tracks and we can go and we can look for step for step until we can find where that animal is resting so that's one way the other way is to drive like we're doing now and to use our eyes to be able to spot animals so when we're driving myself and Sebastian we're looking all around and we're looking high and low under the trees in the trees all over to try and spot all kinds of different animals and so that's how we do it here in South Africa in Kenya is a little bit different because because it's so open and, and the grass is a little shorter and the bush is not as dense and thick they can be able to spot the animals they don't actually have to track like we do here also we're allowed to get out on foot and to walk around to try and find the animals in Kenya it's not allowed so it's a different system but I think these lions have moved all the way up this road which is not good news because they are heading to an area that we can't go unfortunately we have a boundary to our north here and that means that these lions might cross over unfortunately and move out of our area but I'm going to go and double check and while I do that Let's go across to my long haired friend, and it's not Jamie, but Brent. Well, thank you, Tristan. Thank you. We've just managed to get across the Talek River. We had to leave Imani. She failed in her hunting there, and uh, unfortunately, the gremlins just kept attacking us. So we've crossed the Talek River. We're about probably a kilometre or two kilometres south of Talek Gate itself and uh, there's a whole heap of Vildis that have moved into this area and it's quite nice to hear the newing of the Gnus I haven't heard too much of in the last little while since the Serengeti migration has left isn't that absolutely stunning boom 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 now we we are we're looking at a bit of trouble and I'm just gonna move the car slightly. And I also get a bit close to the wildebeest at the same time. Um, so Jamie and Craig got stuck in a very big storm on their way across this side. Manu and I managed to sneak around the edge of it because we left a little bit later. But uh, we're all staying at Camp Oloshaiki tonight, and uh, that is upstream from Talek Gate. And I'm just going to give you a quick view of what's coming our way. And I've been keeping an eye on it, but it is coming closer and closer and closer. And I'd say it's probably 10 kilometers away. There we go. You can see Talek Town. There we go. Big storm coming. Well, White Oaks Elementary have got an X. Excellent question, which is, are Kenya and South Africa in the same biome? Oof. You guys are smart. Well, yes, sort of. Um, it is still considered the savanna biome, although within the savanna biome, there are lots of other types of uh, mini biomes or, or ecosystems. But yes, we're still within the savanna biome. We're in two very different types of savanna biome. Uh, the Sabi Sands is a dry savanna biome, and the Masai Mara is a very wet savanna biome, as you can see, there's lots of rain coming. Uh, whereas the Sabi Sands normally only gets their rain uh, during the summer months, 
Uh, we will get rain throughout the year here in the Mara with uh, two peak seasons, the little rains and the big rains, and we're busy through uh, with the little rains at the moment, although they don't look so little when you're sitting down here. Oh, we've still got this wonderful big group of Vildies, and they're getting busy. There's a couple that are chasing each other about. Now, of course, the females are only going to give birth in about February, but it seems like some of the males are getting a little bit confused already, and you can see them chasing the younger males about. New, boom, boom. Boom, boom. I do love that sound. Some people find it, um, oh, he's having a nice good roll in the mud after the rain. There we go, scratching the nose. Now, often wildebeest will dig their horns into the mud as well. <laughs> Just look at that. Now, there's multiple reasons why they do this. One is because it feels nice. It helps coat them with a bit of mud to help stop the flies. Um, it also helps them to uh, encase any ticks and get rid of any ticks that might be on them. And the males, however, sometimes will put their horns right into the mud. Oh, that one is having the best time. I'm actually quite jealous. Uh, hit their horns into the mud and cake their, their, their horns in mud, and that is to make themselves look a little bit more impressive and uh, in case there's some competition. Now, that is a female doing it. She's doing it because it feels nice and maybe to get rid of a few itchy parasites that are on her forehead and on her body. There's a male. Look at him. No, no, I'm going to just check everything's okay. Is everything okay, guys? Is everything okay? Okay. Okay. Why are you running away? Why are you running away? I, just, I was just checking everything was okay. They are silly creatures. Well, it's been great having our wonderful schools with us. Uh, sorry, we weren't there for too much. We had some technical difficulties today, but it's always great having you with us and look forward to having you on another school drive soon. But while we sit here and take in the beautiful vista of the loiter herd of wildebeest that are remaining in the Mara, Jamie is with the five musketeers who the wildebeest definitely want to avoid.